and uh, welcome everyone. Good to see some familiar faces in the chat. Um, for those of you who don't know me, as Dizzy said, I work for an organization called Flow State. My name is Aaron Evans. We're fundamentally a sales enablement consultancy. Um, and I'm particularly excited about talking about competency frameworks today um, because we perceive it to be one of the most important building blocks to sales excellence. So without further ado, let's talk about what we're trying to achieve today. So first of all, we want to understand what a competency framework actually is from a functional perspective. Now, many an evening I sit there with a glass of wine passionately talking to my wife about uh, competency frameworks only to see her eyes glaze over as it's something that she has absolutely zero interest in. But much like a kind of big wool knit sweater, it's not particularly sexy, but it is incredibly functional and also incredibly practical as well. So we're going to talk about what it actually is and what it does. We're going to explore the multiple ways that competency frameworks can actually help an organisation, whether it's hiring talent, developing talent, retaining or promoting, and how it actually feeds into those functions to make sure that we are setting a standard of what great looks like within a business examine the positive impact from our ICs and teams perspective in terms of how it enables a great culture, which is important for accountability, continual improvement and job satisfaction as well. And also understand how scoring when it comes to competency frameworks can actually start uh, ultimately fostering a high performance environment and also create transparency and accountability in that process as well. So if we can achieve all of this, I think we've had a very, very successful hour or however long it takes. And lastly, personally, I, I, I want you guys to leave here with a couple of things. I want you to leave here understanding, first of all, why it's so important. But second of all, if you don't have one, what you need to do to actually go and create a competency framework and what's, what it means to actually drive a business forward and how it helps. So without further ado, um, Izzy referenced this before, and this is something that uh, myself and Raf, um, who is one of my fellow co-founders over at Flow State, believe in passionately. And this is the 12 pillars of sales excellence. Now, I'm going to remain quiet just for a couple of seconds, just so you guys can flick your eyes over all of these, uh, these different pillars and, and, and start getting an understanding of a couple of things, right? So first of all, is this something that your business is concentrating on? Looking at these pillars, are these areas that you feel you have a play in? And second of all, what does the maturity of that play look like in these pillars? Is it something that's deeply embedded in the culture and in the, the operations of the organization? Now, the observant ones amongst you will notice that the very first pillar is a sales competency framework. And um, look, this isn't a shameless plug for our organization, but we go into businesses all over the world. And one of the first questions we ask is, do you have a sales competency framework? because it actually helps lay the foundation down for success within a sales organization. Now, what's the problem that we're actually trying to solve with a competency framework? Well, I think this picture beautifully illustrates it. And I've mentioned it before, that it is one of the key foundations when it comes to building those sales organizations that can perform to a really good standard. But let's think about it like this, right? So let's say you're looking to hire someone. What are you even looking for in that person? And if you don't have the answers to that question, it often pertains to making a bad hire. And as we always know, when you get a bad hire, it's very difficult to a, get them out of the business, but also the cost and the resource that goes into them is exorbitant as well. And then when you've got those people in the business, are you developing them on the right skills that are actually going to drive success and are actually going to focus on what the organization is trying to achieve? And then look at it through this lens. If you're looking to promote people when you're within your organization, what kind of rationale do you approach that task with? Like, do you know what the core skills are that these people need to do? Are you scoring and benchmarking those people against those skills? Even onboarding, when you're onboarding someone, like, are you making sure that the curriculum that you've built and the training that you're doing when you're onboarding someone or the knowledge or the values or the skills that you're giving them are the right skills that are actually going to focus on what makes the business successful? Now, we typically get two answers or, or sometimes three answers to this, which is, Yes, we have a competency framework, which is great because that means we've got something that we can work with. Number two is, yeah, we built one, but it's sitting in a drawer and no one ever uses it, which again is great because at least they've gone through that process. And the last one is, no, we don't have a competency framework, which is good and bad because it means it's something that we can bring to the forefront and help them build. But ultimately, we need to transact the importance of that competency framework. So what is it and why is it so important? And this sentence sort of perfectly sums it up. It provides a common definition of the desired traits that are most valuable within the organization for each role. It gives clarity around what good looks like across a range of different categories. 
Now, when it comes to selecting the right competencies, it's important to group them in the right areas. And the first thing we're going to talk about is what we call competency categories. So the first one is skill set, right? So what are the hard skills that someone needs to have to do the job? So most of us in the room are likely in sales, right? So let's think about what core skills look like. The ability to negotiate, the ability to handle objections, the ability to ask good quality questions that are going to drive a discovery and find pain. That's what we mean by skill set. Then there's the mindset, which is how do they approach the task from a mindset point of view? And again, we know in sales, the most common one that comes up is things like resilience, um, you know, the things like the ability to take no's, uh, all of those things that we put under mindset. Then we have process, like within any sales organization, there are a series of processes that we deem to be important, whether that's running a sales process, whether that's running a qualification process, whether that's forecasting. These are all processes that we need to ultimately make sure that the people that we were bringing into the business or developing in the business have those competencies and are able to do it. And then we have the knowledge. So within any sales organization, you need to have an understanding of the product that you sell, the market that you sell into, the range of competitors that are out there in the market as well. Micro trends, macro trends that are going on within that industry. Again, going through the process of codifying this is really, really important. Lastly, this is something that's particularly, uh, particularly pertinent at the moment and something that's also very close to our heart is that a lot of organizations have company values. And again, we find that these are typically two categories which are founder-led values where the founders push the values onto the organization, which has its place. But there's also values that the organization comes up with collectively. Now, the question I always ask is, is that how are you, how are you codifying that and how are you looking for those values in the people that you have in the business and you bring into the business? This for us is always a really interesting journey, right? So when we sit down with customers, the process that we go through is incredibly valuable in itself. So we get all the core people into a room and we start talking about what are the non-negotiable competencies that you want to see as a baseline within your organization. And we hear some really interesting stuff come out the back of it, right? So we worked with an organization recently and they, they felt that, as an example, that negotiation with where their product was going, where the market was, was an absolute non-negotiable for their business at the moment. But something really happens when you go through this journey, right? So when you get all the core stakeholders in a room, and that might be the sales manager, it might be the HR function, it might be, um, you know, the next layer down within sales, be it the ICs or the people involved in building this. And we get them in a room and we start talking about competencies something really interesting starts to happen. You start seeing them start codifying what those competencies are, but also justifying why those competencies are so important. And this process for us is so valuable, right? Because you start looking each other in the whites of the eyes and actually saying, this is what an ideal person working for our business looks like. Here's the list of things they have and need to be successful in our business. And we often get people butting heads and arguing about this, which is great because you start seeing them justifying why they feel that's so important. And also there goes a bit of an awkward time where we, they start looking at themselves and seeing whether they have these competencies, whether they have these values or knowledge or processes. So fundamentally, once you've grouped those, those, uh, those, those competencies into categories, we need to then go a layer deeper and start deciding what those competencies actually are. I'm just gonna take a quick pause there to see if there's any questions that come up so far. Um, is, is there anything that, you, that anyone's put in the chat? Nothing's come up just yet, but I'd love to ask you, from your experience working in the industry, Aaron, what would you say is the most important um, non-negotiable? It's so hard to say, right? It's so different for every business. And it's a really good question, right? Because when you're picking competencies, they should align to where the business is moving and where strategically the business is trying to go as well. So, so let me give you an example of that, right? If you're working for a sales organization and one of your aspirations is a growing average order value, as opposed to just winning more units, then that needs to be reflected in the competencies that you're choosing as a base level for those candidates or for those people internally within the organization. So one thing that we, we always recommend to clients is, is that um, we go for a process of giving them a bank of competencies. So we'll say to them like, here's a hundred competencies. You guys start deciding which ones you feel are important and start whittling down what those non-negotiables are. But we always ask them to look through the lens of where the business is moving, because that's mm -hmm. going to start dictating what those those, you know, basically valuable competencies are. Yeah, definitely. Answer your question? 
Yes, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. So this is why it's so powerful. Um, what does it actually mean and what does it actually look like? Well, fundamentally, within the organisation, at every single level, you should have a breakdown of the role within the business, the competency groupings you're looking for, and what those core competencies are. Now, the, the interesting thing for us actually comes down to the definition of those competencies. So you need a real clear, unambiguous definition of what each one of those competencies means. So you get group buying and agreement on what that competency framework looks like. And that's really, really important. Now, this is part of the problem. There's, there's a couple of mistakes that businesses make. So number one is that they choose way too many competencies. Now, this can become incredibly overwhelming. If you're a sales manager, as an example, and you're coaching someone to competencies and you realize that you've got 500 of them that you've got to work through, you'll find very quickly that that task falls by the wayside or it becomes overwhelming for both the rep and the manager. Um, so what we what we recommend as a, as a number is for any role never to have more than 30 competencies and obviously keep it within those groupings as well. So that's mistake number one. Mistake number two is actually the format and the function of this as well. Right. So we'd recommend that try and build your competency framework to align to things like the personal development programs that you have within an organization, the performance management programs you have within an organization. Your talent selection scorecards, as an example, should reflect the competencies. That way, the competency framework comes alive. Now, when you think about it, whenever you're making a decision around personnel within, within the business, the central thread of that decision should be based on the competencies, because this is the laundry list of things that people have or need to have to do the job. And if you're not living and breathing those competencies, it will really quickly fall by the wayside. It's a really important point. I think we might have had a question just come through on the chat as well. Yeah, we've just had one from Beth. She said, most organisations don't have this framework set up. How do you encourage individual contributors to set this up for themselves? Yeah, really good question. It's a great question. Um, so the first thing I do is I think we need to educate the business on why it's so important and how it affects the decisions that we make within a business, right? But second of all is that we, we have to realise that this isn't something that's necessarily just driven through sales. There are four or five key stakeholders involved that it directly affects their role within the organisation, right? So uh, I can speak from, from experience in sales enablement that we build curriculums based on the competency framework. So one of the key stakeholders that you need buying from is sales enablement, right? And then you've got the HR function as well, right? So these guys are, are the people who are deciding what good looks like within the organisation and what performance management looks like in the organisation. So you have to have uh, someone within HR who's fully bought into this. And then also there's the recruitment team, if you have one, and how they select talent. So straight away, they need to be involved. And then there's the sales managers who are day to day managing the team and need this framework to actually identify what it is they're working on with their rep and how they're actually successful against those competencies as well. So if you can get all those people in a room and you can educate them to the importance of this, it becomes really, really interesting. We're going to talk about this a bit later on, but... When we start looking at the maturity of a competency framework and what it gives us, it actually does start become really become really, really exciting, right? So let me give you a, a hypothetical scenario. So much money is spent on hiring sales managers from outside of the organization. Izzy, forgive me for saying this because I know you guys are in recruitment, but you know it's an expensive process for bringing a sales manager into the business. And often the knowledge from the market, from the competitor and from the product point of view that they're bringing in is not relevant or valid. The culture that they're bringing sometimes isn't necessarily consistent with what the business is looking for. Now, I guarantee now within your sales organization, there may be five, six, seven people who have the potential to be leaders based on the competencies that they're displaying. That might be coaching, that might be the leadership qualities, that might be the communication skills, that might be the way that they articulate the why behind decisions are being made. Now, what great businesses do is they ring fence those individuals because they're showing the right competencies for leadership. And then they develop those leaders over a one year program. So when a, a leadership role does come up, they're actually picking from a pool of people within the business and are showing the right skills and competencies to move into that role. But more importantly, you're developing them already before they're doing the job to then go into that role. So there's just one user case. Use case is an example of how it can save the business a ton of money. It can create aspiration within the sales force that there is opportunity to to, to grow, but also it develops the core skills that people are good at and showing the potential for in, in the role as well. But we're going to touch on that a little bit later.
I don't know if there's been another question come through or not. Is that another question? The same one? No, there hasn't. But I did want to ask you, because I know we um, saw each other at the Sales Innovation Expo and we both listened to um, Kate Lewis, the CEO of E4 Enables, chat about competency very much. She said, and like, I think it's an important question to ask before we get too much into it, but she said that the competency framework is the unsung hero. Mm. Why do you think that is? Is it because not enough people are using it or is it something that can really help the business that not enough people know about? Well, there's a couple of reasons, right? So first of all, I think the problem is, is that when people when people go through the process of building a competency framework, they think the output they're getting is a document, right? That's, they think the output they're getting is a document. The thing that, that's often missed is actually the process of building the document is where the real power comes in, right? It's created alignment amongst senior leadership within the organization. It set a standard of what we're looking for in, in, in sales excellence across the organization. It's set a blueprint for who we want to bring into the business based on core skills, values, knowledge, process, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So by going through this process, ultimately, it starts helping the business rationalize and understand the standards that they're setting and what they want and what they need to actually achieve and hit excellence. The output is really simple, right? Look, I've got one on my screen now. You look at it and it doesn't look that interesting. But then you start looking at the application of it and the multitude of different things that it can do. It becomes really, really valuable. A great way of visualizing it, right, is that if, if I was to ask you to bake a cake today and I didn't give you a list of ingredients, what starts happening is, is the, the output that you end up getting is pretty dire, right? You don't know what to put in there. All you know is you need a cake. And that's what the competency framework is. It's a list of core ingredients that are ultimately going to get you the outcome that you need. Um, right, doing the technical bake on bake off. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll find very quickly that most of my analogies have our food related, and you probably see Love them Earth as well. Um, <laughs> we can relate. We've had two more questions come through, Erin. Are you sure. all right to answer them as we? Yeah, yeah, let's, 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 let's do them. Cool. So, the first one is Do you find vastly different competency frameworks based on the team focus? So, an example would be enterprise versus bin market teams. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. And they should be different as well, right? The core skills that you're looking to somebody sells into the mid market should be very different to those that sell into enterprise. The last organization that we went through with this had a structure from uh, basically low tier accounts, mid tier accounts and enterprise accounts. And if you were to get a commercy framework for one of their uh, low tier uh, account managers and one of their enterprise account managers, they're almost indistinguishable. Oh, sorry, they're almost uh, they're, they're almost completely different because the core skills that are driving the outcome you want are absolutely different. And again, it comes back to what I said before. The, the, the absolute basis of this should be around what the business is trying to achieve. And then you work backwards from those goals to start defining what the uh, optimum and desired competencies are. And that's why I feel like this is such an interesting topic because there's not just one answer. There's not just like one thing that you can go off. It really has to be relevant to each each company and their growth stages. Um, I don't know if you're going to answer this question um, later on in the session. I feel like you might. But Rocco said, how do you actually rate people within the specific competency and what is the frequency at which this evaluation should be done in order to keep on track? It's a really good question again. Right. So. Again, what I'd get us to think about is the application of the competency framework and the different ways that it can be used, right? So if we're building the competency framework as part of a personal development program with someone, then quarterly is fine for that, right? So we can start marking them against achievement and marking them against um, uh, where we think we are in that competency. Now, naturally, some of it is going to be subjective, like any scoring when we're looking at certain competencies, we have to have some subjective measures to it because it's just the nature of scoring as we go through it. But what we often find and what we often ask people to do is when they come to their personal development programs, it should be on the rep to bring almost a dossier of evidence of how they're performing against their competencies so they can demonstrate and also, you know, rationalize those competencies and how they're doing. So I think from a personal development program point of view, it should be quarterly. But then if we distill it down into how we can use a competency framework almost as like a coaching mechanism, we might be able to build a scorecard where we use on every single coaching call we do with people, where we start marking them against how they've performed on that competency. So we might have the day-to-day -day scoring and coaching around the competency framework, and then that feeds straight up into the uh, personal development program. And then this is really interesting. We can start putting benchmarks for each role. So when we come to start selecting who we want to promote into a role, we might turn around and go, if we take forecasting as a competency that we look for, we want someone who's shown 90% forecast accuracy over the last year. 
And only those people can apply for the role of an AE, or AE or a senior AE. Mm. And, and by putting those benchmarks on it, you're setting the standard really, really high. But also you're creating absolute transparency and clarity with the rep of what they need to move into the next role and be promoted. Great question. Shows that you're thinking about things in exactly the right way. Yeah, and that's so important. Definitely, like coming from a recruitment background, we see all candidates are interested in seeing progression and realistically how they can actually get to that next level. So if you've set these competency frameworks out, you actually understand what realistic goals do I need to achieve to get to that next level? And it's not ambiguous and like it's a, a mountain to climb. Yeah, and you get hard to get there. Great. Yeah, it's, it's, those are all the questions for the moment. Um, yeah, sure. Oh, Brazzy was just being lovely about you in the chat, saying <laughs> he can vouch for Beth's comment that you've um, given them value along with Raf in working with him. Oh, you're, you're, you're making me blush. Thank you very much. <laughs> we had a really interesting anecdote this week where, and, and, it, and it really starts showing the value of this. Um, we had a, a customer turn around to us literally yesterday and say, we're going on a big recruitment drive and we rejected three candidates that we would have usually hired, but we rejected them because of the competency framework. Now that for us is like, you know, that, that, that is, that is a, a, a fantastic piece of evidence that this business is actually setting a new standard for what they're looking for. But more importantly, if we think about the effects that would have had on the organization if they had have hired them, they'd have someone who isn't up to the standard they're looking for. Ramp times would have been slower, potentially a poor performer, potentially performance managing someone out of the business. So for us, that's a, that's a really good sign that it's doing what it needs to do. Now, sitting in a spreadsheet like this isn't valuable. And, and you mentioned before, Izzy, about um, a company called E4 Enable, and we're big advocates of this business. Now, what they've done really, really well, and we recommend that businesses eventually move to a product like this, is that they've turned it into a platform that integrates with different areas of the business. And it can actually start being something that is the top of mind in conversation when it comes to talking about competencies. The other part here, which is really important, is that particularly when you first build a competency framework, it's not just about the manager sitting down and going, right, I'm scoring you this. There's a really lovely conversation that can take place where we actually start getting the reps to self-score. And even us as individuals should self-score ourselves. Because what we find is actually really fascinating because the conversation then starts around the gap. It doesn't start around just the competency, it's in the gap. Now, we often find that people actually underscore themselves as well. There's a really good opportunity there to talk about why we've scored them, what we've scored them, and rationalizing this and bring competencies at the front of that conversation as well. I think there may be a couple more questions come through. Or should yeah, we... I think Beth has to drop off in two minutes. So she just okay. wanted to quickly ask one more question saying, what about mindset competencies for salespeople? This is a huge thing. Did you mention this? Yes, absolutely. That's... Did I miss it? That's one of the five categories that we have is mindset. And we wholeheartedly agree that it's really important. And it's also something that should be brought front of mind when discussing this, because that's how you get behavioral change is defining what a good mindset looks like and then working and coaching with the rep on those things as well and looking for evidence of those competencies around mindset as well. So, yeah, really good question. And you mentioned, Erin, that um, reps often, well, not some of them sometimes um, underscore themselves. What would you do as a leader when a rep isn't seeing the value that they bring to the business and actually understanding their capabilities if they are actually performing higher than, than what they've scored themselves? Because normally sometimes you have to bring them down. But how do you bring them up? Well, again, it's evidence, right? So I think the, the quicker we can, and, and again, part of this is the, the conversations we see when there isn't a competency framework is that that conversation would be lost in translation because someone would turn around and go, I'm really crap at questioning. And the manager goes, no, I think you're quite good. And then they go, okay, fine, take care. But it's with this now, because you've codified it as a competency and you're both talking around that competency and you're scoring around that competency and you're looking for evidence of that competency, the conversation now comes alive, right? Where you can turn around and go, actually, on this call, I saw you mention this, this, and this. That's demonstrating that you're doing that competency really, really well. This is why I've scored you a three on that competency. So again, it's about having evidence and the codification of that competency that actually makes it become real and not just an ethereal conversation. Now, let's look at it from another point of view, which is around coaching around a competency. So many times within organizations, we see coaching interactions where someone turns around and goes, oh, I'm, I'm asking questions. And the manager goes, oh, the questions could be better. Go and ask better questions. And then they leave and then they never follow up. Whereas when you're, when you're isolating a competency and you're working on it, 
you see you close the loop on that competency when someone reaches a certain level and you keep working on it until you both agree now that this is the score and it's of a good standard so it actually creates focus and shines a light on the right things to be working on but also enriches the coaching conversation that you're having with the individual and without that codification those conversations just don't happen they just become really ethereal nicey nicey chats that don't have an outcome and that's why this process is so 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 key Mm. Have one question? More, yeah Sorry. definitely we've had one more question um saying Erin I made four hires this year two one senior one junior and are below standard on numbers of course core skill sets we have a version of job competencies required but I'm encouraged to keep and coach them how do you draw the line on the role coaching can play versus the capabilities of the actual rep well, look, I think the key word that's often missing is accountability, right? There's there's only so much you can do as a manager to coach your, coach your rep and move them to the right level. And if they're not showing evidence of that and they're not showing improvement on that, then they have to move into a performance program. The one thing I will say is that often the accountability is too late. So we start, we start a poor performance program three, four, five, six months into poor performance. Whereas in actuality, the manager's accountability is realizing that poor performance is one bad month. And then we have a proactive program that we put these people on to start improving that performance. And this is where sales enablement and management need to work really closely together, is that when you do have a poor performer, even after one month, we know what the competencies are they need to work on. And you can lean on sales enablement and go, look, here's the four competencies I want them to work on over the next two months. Here's the courses that they need to go on. Here's the scoring of those courses. So when they've done the course, they take an exam or a quiz to prove that they've and demonstrate that they've taken on board the learning. And then the accountability is with the rep. So you can now turn around and say, look, you were poor performing. We've supported you by putting you on the right programs. You've not scored well on those programs. We've also invested in coaching with you on this. And then the conversation becomes a little bit more serious. My worry is, is that poor performance often becomes a habit and an acceptable habit. So we wait for three to six months to start talking about poor performance. Look, and the, the short answer to your question is, is that there's only so much you can do when you make a bad hire and they're very regular. We've got to try and nip that in the bud as quickly as possible. There's one thing I'd add to that question, because it's a really good question, is that we often don't start testing performance until month three or four or, four or five once they're ramped. We should be testing performance on onboarding. So when you put someone through an onboarding program, there should be a certification that they have to pass to prove that they're now onboarded. That healthy bit of pressure sets the standard, but also encourages them to take the onboarding really seriously. It's not just about getting a branded T-shirt and eating muffins and listening to HR. It's actually about taking your onboarding really, really seriously. And if you've got someone who can't go through an onboarding and pass, then already they can be put into a coaching program or you can make a decision whether they're a good fit or not after three months as opposed to six months. Hopefully that answers the question. I'm sure it does. Do you want to go on to the next slide and then do some more questions after the next one? Absolutely. Really, really good question so far, guys. But I wanted to give you guys a taste of what these competencies actually look like as you're going through, right? So here we've got an example of skill set, which is for prospecting and opening. We've got qualifying pain, handling fob offs, gaining commitment, etc. But the bit I want to draw your attention to is the description. This part here is really, really important, is that you have to be absolutely clear on what that description is and get a, a mutual agreement on what we all mean by this. Because this description ultimately is what is going to be used day to day to actually rationalize the competency and grade people against that competency as well. So again, this is a collective understanding that the business needs to come up with or the course the key stakeholders within the competency framework need to come up with as well to make sure that there is core alignment on those. Here's an example of mindset as well. Uh, and we've highlighted accountability, coachability, positivity, resilience, and data-driven, uh, results-driven, sorry, I should say. Same with process execution. Here's some examples for you as well. But as you can start seeing from this is that you realize that actually within any given role, there are a whole heap of competencies that are really, really important that often aren't front of mind. And we need to make sure that these are at least listed down so we know what we're looking for. Same with knowledge. We've left out values because often they sit individually with the business as well. So straight away, what we're seeing um, is that a sales competency framework, a sales competency framework actually starts helping talent in a multitude of different ways. Let's just go through some of these now to sort of really understand that. So first of all, when we're going through the process of attracting talent, I'm not being funny, but if I was to give Izzy a competency framework or someone at Wiser our competency framework and go, right, go find me people who demonstrate all of these competencies. 
that becomes really, really easy for the recruiter to find the right people. And I think I speak for all recruiters when I say that uh, one of the things that lets the relationship down between the recruiter and the client is actually the briefing of what they're looking for and the inability to actually articulate what good looks like within their organization. And then when you get that talent um, through to interview, it then becomes how you start scoring and assessing that talent on those competencies, but also how you start extracting evidence of those competencies in the interview process as well. And then with the onboarding, right? So you should be building your onboarding curriculum based around the competencies that you're looking to develop, nurture and foster within the individual that means they're gonna be successful in their job. And then when they are successful in their job or maybe not successful in their job, you can performance manage them against those competencies. Day to day, whether it's the enablement function or whether it's the manager locally, this then becomes the focus of where you're training and coaching as well. On top of that, we work with many businesses to help them outline what their curriculum looks like. And as their organization changes and as the, as the competencies change within roles, the curriculum should develop in the same way based on the competencies. You know, there's no point having how to, you know, fry the perfect egg in your training uh, uh, curriculum if no one's ever going to fry an egg. It's just a waste of time. And often we go in and see all of these different courses that actually have no functional value based on what the business needs. And you can just trim the fat on that straight away. And then when it comes to actually deciding your talent map and who's moving into which role and the, and the types of competencies needed to move into each role, this becomes really interesting because you can start actually forward planning for your organization around talent based on the competencies that people have or need to have to do the role next. And a bit that's not spoken about so much is leadership development. We should be running every single person in sales through a competency framework. So we go right up to VP of sales, but we sit there and we have an awkward conversation around what the core skills are needed to be a VP of sales. And we should use this to start developing the leadership within that business as well. And lastly, I touched on before this idea around succession planning as well knowing the competencies that people have within role and the ones they have for the future role, meaning they can make a real smooth transition into promotion or, or going throughout the business. And on this last note, I think I mentioned it before, but I'll touch on it again. It should then become the criteria for who gets promoted. So you should know who you're promoting before you promote them based on their competency scoring and based on the programs you're putting them on before they move into that role. I'm not sure we've had any more questions come through, but I've seen a couple of little um, things in the tub. I love the, uh, the food references. <laughs> <laughs> talking about frying an egg uh, we've got a couple coming through so um raf says with sales hiring coaching enablement becoming critical in the modern selling landscape why is that that in 2021 so many sales organizations still struggle to develop and operationalize a competency framework well because like all things that are hard people tend to avoid it right it's a difficult process to go through number one um i think number two there often isn't an understanding or an alignment on what it is and the value that it has, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. Look, you know, as I said to you before, when we first go into an organization, this is the first thing that we talk about. And often it's the thing that starts driving what our engagement looks like based on this. But when, when we think about it, right, I think it's often assumed as well, right? If you were to go into your business now and grab four managers and ask them what the ideal profile looks like for a candidate, they'd all be completely different. But I guarantee that they, they, they'd uh, assume that everyone is saying what they're saying. Now, we should spend the time to sit down. And this is a long process. It can take up to three months to build this with the right stakeholders and actually be able to look ourselves in the whites of the eyes and say, this is what good looks like. And this is what we should be bringing into the business. But that process is often difficult and fraught. But like I said before, by going through that process is really where you create alignment within the organization, which is so, so, so powerful. The conversations that start coming out the back of it when you build a, com a competency framework are really interesting. I mean, Raf and I often break a pull cue and throw it into the room and let people fight it out because you start realizing what people really believe is important for the business and what core competencies they should be looking for. And by going through that process of arguing and disagreeing and then coming to a collective, a, a collective agreement on that is such a powerful process. Mm. Hopefully that answered the question, Raf. Definitely. And as the saying goes, if it was easy, everyone would do it. And this is what I think really separates high performing sales teams to those that can't quite get to that next level. So it is really, really important to have. Um, Josue said, hey, Aaron, could you briefly speak to the role um, to the role NLP can play in improving sales performance. I want to use some of my training budget for it, but want to have a strong case as why it's useful. 
Yeah, I mean, I won't go into too much detail because it's slightly different from this topic. But if, it, if we feel that there's enough interest, I can talk about it uh, at a later date and maybe do, it, do something else around it if there's value. But when you start thinking about what NLP fundamentally is, it's, it's about helping people communicate and build trust with the people that they communicate with. So straight away, we're seeing that there's a big sort of Venn diagram crossover with sales in general there. But it also starts touching into the way that we communicate with ourselves, the stories that we tell ourselves and our belief system as well. So for us, in terms of where we find it is actually really effective with the businesses that we work with, number one is helping the sales organization become much more effective in the way they communicate, not just to their clients and their prospects, but to each other as well internally. And second of all, you know, sales is a performance game, right? So people need to approach it with the right mindset. So if we can unpick some of the stories, the negative uh, kind of anecdotes and mindset that people approach some of these really quite intensive tasks with, it can have a massive effect and incremental gain on how they start performing. So uh, happy to share some more information if you want to uh, touch base with me afterwards or hit me on LinkedIn, or maybe we can do a talk about it another time, but it's a really powerful mechanism for helping with communication and belief. Yes, definitely. And if anybody else has any questions after this session that you just think of um, when it finishes, then please do connect with Erin. Um, Martin, the recording, oh, he wants to show it to our CEO. Um, we will be sharing it after um, with all the attendees. I'll send out an email along with the link to sign up to the Elite if you're a leader or founder. Um, and also if you're in one of our communities, I'll pop the recording in there too. Um, Luke says, um, Erin, love your work. Between which levels should core competencies be shared? Um, we're big believers in sharing them to every single person in the business and having them as a badge of honour that people can carry around with them. And that includes scoring as well. Um, and I even go as far as saying that we can even start developing league tables on scoring because I find it so interesting that we're really happy in sales to start talking about outputs on, on, and, and sharing outputs around how much revenue someone's booked, how many meetings people have booked. But we never share league tables on inputs and inputs for me are really, really important. So for organizations that we work with and in previous organizations I've worked for, we often share people's scoring and competencies and celebrate those that are moving in the right direction on that scoring as well and improving. I think for this to work effectively, transparency and authenticity is absolutely key. This can't be something that managers grab, go in a room and start talking about in a clandestine fashion that never gets shared with the individual. I think at every single level, this should be shared and be worn like a badge of honor and how they're performing against a competency framework as well. It's a really good question. Really good question. Thank you. Those are all the questions for the moment. Okay, so I want to touch on this because it's uncomfortable and it's scary, but it's really important. And this is about scoring in general, right? Is that it's important to score because it starts benchmarking, but it also helps you see how much you've grown. Oh, you're seeing the reference on the screen now. And look, here's the way that we look at it. And um, this looks a bit uncomfortable and looks a bit weird, but think about it from this point of view. We've got all the competencies on the left-hand side, and then we've got the different reps within the organization. Now, this is where it becomes so, so, so valuable, is that you don't just score the rep on the current competencies that they have. You score the rep on the competencies for the next role, the next logical role within the business. This is so important. It does two things, which is really, really valuable. When someone does really well in their role, you can start picking off competencies and go, right, let's get you ready for the next role. Let's work on what stage three or four looks like within this competency. And then all of a sudden, you've got an aspiration that you're working on and you're moving someone in the same in the right direction. And then when the role comes available, you've got someone who's already doing the role. You just need to now move them in the role, which is really important. Um, and second of all, look, it's you've got to shine a light on these things. If someone's performing poorly in an area, a conversation has to take place in a vacuum is where you get poor communication. So if this didn't exist. Imagine what the conversations around performance look like. And I've had those conversations. I've I had a manager drag me in the room and go, we, we don't think your, your mindset's right. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, your just mindset's not right. Yeah, but, but what, what specifically? Well, you've got to start showing a better mindset. Whereas now you can turn around to them and you can go, okay, coachability. We scored you two on this. The reason we've done that is we've run three coaching sessions with you this week and you're not actually, and you're not actually showing improvement. How do we work on this together? And then you're actually labeling something and you're both talking about the same thing and it's rational and there's evidence. And all of a sudden you can start coming up with a mutual plan to start working on this. So what I'd say about scoring is, is that as uncomfortable as it is, particularly at the beginning, actually it starts becoming a really, really important part of developing a competency framework. And look, we're in sales, right? 
scoring is inevitable. At some point, someone's going to sit you down and doing, say you're, going to, you're doing a good job or a bad job based on these things. But what we really want to focus on is inputs. This, this for me is really interesting. So uh, I hate to keep going on about our, our, our clients, but it's a really important conversation is that so many coaching conversations are around outputs and they are a waste of time because it's already happened. We have to start focusing on the inputs that drive the outputs. It's a more interesting conversation between the rep and the manager. It's working on something that actually has a long-term gain. It's upskilling. It's more engaging. It's more exciting. It's more interesting for the person that you're coaching. And ultimately, it's training them how to do things in a repeatable and predictable way going forward. If we only coach on outcomes, you're going to miss so much value and you're going to stagnate development. So what the competency framework does so well is it focuses on inputs and can also retrospectively look at the outputs that have been achieved based on those inputs. So it's really complete in the way that it works and transparent in that process as well. Is it always one to three? Because that doesn't seem like a huge bracket to be able to you're either like poor, medium or good, aren't you? But like, do some companies do a, a bigger range or is it always one to three? They can do, sometimes do one to five, but always bear in mind the, the particularly with, with, with the narrowness of the role, right? So if you take an SDR as an example, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're probably only going to be working on about four or five competencies, maybe even less during the course of a year or, or, or a quarter, I should say. So the key thing here is, is that you don't want the scoring to be too ambiguous. So what we do is we actually work with our clients to give definitions for each score as well. So if we take as an example, questioning or, or, or open questions, we might turn around and say a one is you did ask open questions. A two is you asked open questions in a conversational way that made the client feel comfortable. Three is you asked open questions in a conversational way that made the client feel comfortable and there was context to the question and you framed the question again to make it conversational. It's like, okay, now I know why I'm scored that score. Right. So think less about the range of scoring and think more about the definition of the scoring. It's got to be really, really unambiguous. Yeah, and I guess if you have a really clear definition, then every leader across the organisation will be scoring on that same that same reasoning instead of it being like one to ten where five to seven is always so ambiguous of like what does that exactly actually right. mean in the middle great, ladder. great um, input great input Izzy you're thinking about it exactly the right way is that by creating that collective definition everyone is now completely aligned on what that means yeah and there's no confusion <laughs> that one person is like oh I'll give them a three because because I like them it's like no 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 because they've done this yeah that's how you score it that's really interesting um Frayne I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly um said is there a company size when you should start using it and they mean the number of employees etc by this with this question no I mean like anything right the more an organization grows, the harder it is to unpick it and then start bringing in a competency framework. So again, when we're looking at building out effective enablement functions, the first thing you should look at is the competency framework. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't stress this enough, and it's a really good question. Like think about building a house. You don't start with the electrics, you start with the foundations. And the competency framework is actually what will enable your scale and growth because you now know what you're looking for. Now, this doesn't mean you don't revisit your competency framework as the objectives of the business change it might be on a yearly or, or two yearly or even six monthly basis. But again, it's really important that you have a competency framework. Great question again. That's everything for now. Okay, cool. So I put this up on the screen because I think it articulates exactly what I've been saying over the last 50 minutes that fundamentally it is the equivalent of a Swiss army knife within your business. It has so many different roles and functions and actually helps support several different key uh, parts of the organization and different job functions to create consistency, create alignment, create development, create a lens of what good looks like, set the standards and make sure at every opportunity that you're interacting with people, you're talking about the things that are ultimately gonna help the business achieve its overarching ambitions and goals. So how do we do? So get an understanding of what a competency framework is and how it functions. Explore the multiple ways that it can help hire, develop, retain and promote. Examine the positive impacts with the IC, help create accountability, continue improvement and job satisfaction and understand how competency scoring enables high performance.